Thank you. So happy to be able to chat with you today. I know. I actually took a look at some of your socials to see if there were some things that we haven't that haven't come up naturally in conversation between us before. And there's so many things I want to ask you about. <laughs> Okay. But why don't you um, introduce yourself a little bit to anyone who's listening who doesn't know what you do? Okay. Um, my name is Karam. It's pronounced Karam. And uh, my last name is Malitsky Sanchez. Malitsky is Polish. And Sanchez is from my Ecuadorian mom. Um, I was born at a very early age. And I have been running a site called Indie Game Reviewer, uh, dot com since 2007. Um, it's still going and we have a bunch of writers around the world that we still cover tons and tons of, um, brand new indie titles that no one's ever heard of yet. And sometimes we're the only people that cover them. And I find great joy in this process. Um, I'm also developing my own game right now in the Gato engine, which I love. Um, I teach blender for web 3d world building at UCLA extension, and I advocate for open source solutions because I think they're just so exciting and uh, it's amazing to see communities build stuff. We'll talk about that later. Um, and I was an actor for the better part of my life. I kind of put that on the, uh, I wouldn't even call it the back burner. I just sort of put that in the closet about 10 years ago when I started running uh, a VRTO uh, conference, which is a spatial media conference and also the five R's Festival, which is an acronym for the Festival of International Virtual and Augmented Reality Stories, which I launched in 2015. So yeah, with those things, and I'm and I'm um, really always learning better how to work with engineers and programmers, and I'm really proud to be leading a team of about six of them right now um, wow. on a virtual museum that's funded by the government of Canada for a uh, Hispanic Latin American heritage costumes for web 3D. So lots of stuff going on, but lots of stuff. Um, to me, they all kind of connect in some weird way. They kind of connect. What took you from um, acting? Okay, I want to ask about your acting career also. Right. Can you talk a little bit about it? Like, it sounds like you had a really successful, I've seen, I saw some pictures of your IMDB and you look so different in every role. It's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. I actually pride myself on, you know, a, a career that was made up of characters. And I never, never aspired to be, never was interested in being like the leading man or the best friend. Or I just really love um, just taking on really strange roles. And, you know, people that inspired me were like Tim Roth and Gary Oldman and John Malkovich and uh, Tilda Swinton and um, those kinds of folks. So I, well, I started before I had a choice. I started before I had any idea what was even going on on the planet. I was like f four when my mom was sticking me in plays. And then I was doing dinner theater when I was seven and getting home at one in the morning from the dinner theater and then going to a Catholic school in the morning, like six hours later. And, um, you know, I thought I was old by the time I was 14 doing musicals at Young People's Theater in Toronto, but I guess that, that's still young in hindsight. Um, and and then- Definitely young. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know if they, they would allow a lot of the stuff that I was up to to happen today. Um, I remember doing like a production of Evita at this dinner theater in Toronto, and it was like, the, the the director was this old Czechoslovakian guy named Adolf who smoked cigars and drank whiskey incessantly. And he looked like older than, than, than Methuselah to me, but apparently he was like 42 at the time. <laughs> and it's just amazing, you know, how, how things appeared to me. It was, it was a salty, gritty, amazing world. But, you know, mm -hmm. the connection between that and and what I do now is really that I was living in immersive environments. I was living in manufactured virtual worlds on stage and in television. And so uh, I, I, you know, my whole formative years were from the idea of this artifice of, of reality that you put up a set, you put up some lights, you hide all the stuff that shouldn't be on camera. And then you convince people that the thing is really going on. And 
I mean, isn't everything like that? Isn't an event like that? Isn't an indie game like that? Isn't everything that we build is kind of like, what do you need to see right now at this moment? And what don't you need to be rendering? And so anyway, I did that for a long time. I moved to LA uh, around 96 and I've been in LA for 25 years. I live in Hollywood. I like Hollywood. Um, it's not what people think when you say the word Hollywood. It's gritty, chaotic. It's extremely multicultural. Um, the the strip malls have the best first generation immigrant cuisine that you could possibly hope for on the planet and i can hear whatever is like the hot new track because it's usually playing in a car really really loud outside my window um <laughs> so hopefully that's a good summary of my acting career yeah absolutely and like from your reel, you can really see that you did create some really unique characters. And I, I absolutely love that, both in, in games, when I'm trying to create games. So you did a, an amazing job of embodying them. That's really cool to see. Oh, thanks. And, uh, and you you also brought up creating like this um, virtual world. And it's kind of similar. I, my background is in um, user experience. And I feel it's it's also similar. Like you're creating an experience for people. Yeah. Um, it's kind of the same thing. You're creating this world, this this experience that you that you go through. I so really I, appreciate that topic. Actually, I'm I'm actually exhaustedly finishing off the final capstone for a UX certificate at UCLA, and it's oh, wow. been two and a half years of just doing UX case study after case study. But, um, you know, I think it's a fascinating, sometimes uh, exhausting frustrating, difficult process, but UX is really, I mean, I think everybody should know some UX to not be thinking about it when you're building anything at all that you want to be received by anyone else, uh, to not consider it along the way is, is sort of to spell certain doom. <laughs> I mean, yeah. at that point, you're just counting on luck or, or, or goodwill or something. Um, and you know, everything from, and you and I can talk about this for forever, but everything from running like a no face YouTube channel right now where I'm relying on the algorithm to, to propel me where I don't even talk about it to my friends. I'm like, I don't even, maybe there's one or two I hassle, but like I don't promote it. I don't do anything. I literally rely on good UX process to kind of get us to the other side and understand that to companies where I consult on play testing and, and, or some other sort of like business development thing. And, and I, and they say, yeah, we're going to launch it and see how it goes. I'm like, see how it goes. <laughs> You're going to just see how it goes. Like what, what's been going on this whole time. You haven't been like getting input. You haven't been trying to meet people where they are. You haven't been getting insights and, and pivoting and adapting and iterating. I mean, on launch day, it should be almost a sure thing that it's going to meet an audience that wants your product. So right. Uh, yeah, I love that topic. Yeah, me too. And you're so right. It's so, it, it can be almost almost overwhelming though too, because I just always want to like put it in front of people and get other people's feedback. And you you also have to develop a good sense of a, like a good balance of what um, what is important to to change and not just a sense, but I guess there's also, you can do this with metrics as well, but setting up good metrics to know when, when it's time to change things, when it's time to go with the kind of the initial vision and maybe, maybe just a little bit to of polish to make it resonate the right way with the, with the experience, the person experiencing it. Yeah. Um, can be, um, it can be uh, tricky. I always say to, to my students, um, that Neil Gaiman has this really important quote. I don't know if everybody knows this, so excuse me, they do, but, he said, you know, whenever people tell you that something is wrong, um, they're usually right. And whenever they tell you how to fix it, they're usually wrong. So here, here, that problem, if it's hard to walk, if it's hard to see, if it's hard to understand, if it's hard to navigate, they're, they're telling you the truth. Um, but when they're like, you know, do what you should do is you should like totally put like a pink dog, like that shoots out of a cannon. <laughs> they're probably wrong. Right. Well, that, so I have heard that quote before, but I think there should be, it should be like, um, um, amended. So let's do it. Instead of saying that they're wrong, it's like you need to take their suggestions and then like reverse engineer what the actual problem is and then figure out what the best solution is. So if they yeah. want a pink dog, like maybe that's not interesting enough. Maybe it's not like weird enough that they're finding like stuff that's catching their attention. So then yeah. you need to find something. Yeah, there's maybe some, there's a message in it for yes. sure. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's not meant to be discarded, but it's like the, I think the point of it in, in my understanding is don't go chasing waterfalls. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like if you try to accommodate everything for everybody all the time, you get nothing, you get pizza on the, on, on the wrong side down. Right. Um, <laughs> and again, Stephen King had a quote that said, if you try to write for everybody, nobody can relate. But if you write specifically to your personal experience, many people will relate. Mm. Um, so trying to please everybody and follow every idea that they throw at you and every suggestion will probably lead to an un, uh, an unfocused mess that really has no effect. It's, it's just going to sort of, like I said, it would just be sort of like this ethereal blob of whateverness. And, and you have to be able to choose and be specific sometimes in order to give people like a profound experience. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. Some good wise words. And I also agree that everybody should learn a little bit of user experience. I think that it's kind of like you will have a user experience whether you design it or not. And you're either, right. either like you said, it's either an accident or it's very like intentional. And so yeah. having like, some of the things to think about really helps guide that for sure. Yeah. Um, you, you're so quotable. I want to say for the record again that when you came to speak at the conference uh, in the summer of 2023, I asked you, you know, to talk about your experience building an indie game. And also, by the way, you happen to be a woman. Um, and that was part of your talk as well, but that was not the center of it. And the talk that you gave was truly motivated, motivating, not just for a game developer, but for a person, just to be a person, to keep yourself doing the hard stuff that you really don't want to do so that you're ready to do the hard stuff when you have to and to um to to be obstinate and also flexible and to um get up every day and form that schedule where you commit to the thing that you're trying to do and not just treat it as a hobby and to put everything on the line and there were so many really beautiful points that you made and it's funny because when someone says something that resonates it brings people to tears. It's not because it's sad or tragic. It's just that when people hear their struggle reflected in someone else's experience, it sort of like unlocks this latent um, exhaustion, frustration, confusion, sense of lack of, of validation. And that resonance can, can really tap something for people. And you managed to do that really successfully at that show. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging that. And, and I think you're right. Like when you do, when you hear someone say what you've been feeling and put it into the right words, it can, it can really resonate. That's a good point. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for bringing me on to speak. It was like, it was so nice to hear from people and like people came to me after and had so many like really heartwarming things to share that they've gone through and how they can relate. It felt like there was, it created such a great sense of connection, being able to talk to people after sharing that stuff. So. Yeah. And, you know, often as developers, indie developers, as producers, we spend a lot of time in solitude. Like we're on calls all day, but there's this sort of singular experience that's being had on the other side where you, you have to kind of re-motivate yourself. There's no one saying, Hey, this is proven territory. You're, you know, you're going to nail it. It's more like, what do you do? <laughs> Why are you doing this thing? And, um, and it's like, sometimes you got to get out in front of people and, you know, tap dance a little bit and be like, Hey, I do this thing and this is cool. And I've learned a lot and it helps you to maybe perhaps even see your own progress in that thing. I, you know, I'm always, I, I constantly have imposter syndrome. It'll never go away every, you know, and, and I think, what am I going to say about anything? Um, but then I realized I have a lot to say about a lot of things. I've learned a lot from a lot of people. I've synthesized it. I've put the things I'm learning into practice. I don't just sit there with theory, but I, if I don't understand something, I try to understand it. You know, I didn't understand the Godot engine. And I thought, why can't I do this? And now I can do it because I spent eight months before it was cool. It was cool, but people didn't. <laughs> know what it was before people um, knew what it was <laughs> and then you know and then i and then it was cool and i was like yeah cool i know i know what's up and same with modeling i didn't understand how to how to use blender at all it looked like a cockpit you know that interface and now mm. i teach it mm. and 
same with cinematography. It was the last thing I understood. I didn't understand what f-stops and apertures and uh, film speeds were and shutter speeds and all that. And so I studied that at school and now I do know. And that cinematography applies to Blender and the Blender applies to Godot and all those things connect. But be, because I didn't just want to stay on the outside and be like, what esoteric shit is this? It was like, if I don't understand it, I have to get my hands really dirty in it. There's like reading books is not going to do it. You got to do the thing to to work with the thing. And before you know it, your the thing goes away and you're in a flow state mm, and when i teach yeah. my students i'm like the first thing we're going to learn is is hot keys like really seriously i'm like yes i have to get you away from from menu fishing with your mouse your your soap bar on a desk and just be like having a muscle memory twitch reaction to like what it is you need to put up on screen so you can get into a flow state and flow states you know, sorry, this is a bit stream of consciousness, but flow states are a real thing. Like, you you know, inertia, procrastination, all that kind of stuff will murder you. And the best intentioned, strong-willed people fall prey to it. It's, it's a lack of clear definitions and goals. And those things have to be broken down into small, tiny, little achievable things to do. And as I was trying to do this capstone for UX, I was like, oh, my God, no, I don't want to do homework. I don't want to do free unpaid presentations. I don't have time. I'm too old, like a million. I'm too <laughs> tired. I got too much stuff going on. And and it was like, look. So I said to my friend, I said, look, what do I have to do first? And it was like, open Google Slides. Open Google Docs. Get paper onto a table. Get a Sharpie in your hand, you know, and just breaking it down and then Eventually, you are on the other side of the line. You're like, okay, now it's really just this, and let's get it done. Um, so the, the practice of doing the thing is actually not that hard. It's getting yourself to do the thing that you don't understand, that seems insurmountable, that seems esoteric. And that's achievable by just breaking it down into the, the most minute actions that are chained uh, and then before you know it, you're an expert and you're writing books on the subject and people are soliciting your advice, which is by that point, you don't care about anymore. You know, when you don't have that, you're like, oh, God, I have to be a person of influence. I have to have done something with my life. Maybe I have to achieve something. Who am I? I'm no. But then once you're doing those things, all you feel is like, I don't know anything. I'm just a beginner. I'm an empty <laughs> void ready to learn more. There's an impossibly huge amount to learn. And I'm not saying that I've achieved Yoda status in any way, shape, or form, but I do understand that once you start to get really good at a topic, you you sort of inherently develop a humility because because now you really understand what's up and how huge mm -hmm. the the volume of possible knowledge that is available to you can be. Yeah, that's such a good point, and. That, that topic came up on my stream just the other day. Um, somebody was really struggling learning game development. And, and as you know, there's so many faucets to it. There's there's the art, there's, and even just an engine alone, there's so much to it. And I, I try to just remind people like, just, just be okay with not knowing everything. Just learn the first few right. things, get familiar with a bit of time, kind of like you said, um, because it can be so overwhelming that it's so easy to quit because you, the overwhelm is like, huge in game development or even like the technical side of art, whether you're doing 3D or animation, there's so much to learn. And as you said, you have to get used to being in a little bit of chaos. A lot of people, I think there's different, there's different topics. Some things you can have a pretty good understanding, like, uh, I guess it depends. Some things, if they're very small things, you can you can you can get very good at it, and you, there's not a ton more to learn. Right. But in today's age, with all of the constant change in technology, you have to get used to if you're doing something in technology, you have to get used to not knowing everything and being okay with that, and just focusing on the things that you need to know and um, being okay with not knowing everything because you want yeah i mean this topic i think is something that you and i can talk about but maybe if someone has for some reason found this discussion and they've gotten to this point in the conversation they'll hear it and it will help which is that you too can learn this it is truly a 99.9 percent .9 insurmountable task at first but then 
it's a 99.8 insurmountable task because now you learned one thing and that one thing can anchor the next. And I would say that really the same way that you have to break a process down into like put paper on table, it's the same with code. Do not go and try to understand the entire syntax of a language and its history and everything else. Just decide what one thing you want to make happen on screen. I just want to put a freaking cube into a place and rotate it and make it bigger and light it from one side. I just want to make a dot move from left to right. And if I have to take three months to figure that out, then I will do that because later those pixels will add up. So just have a very, very narrow, specific, goal-driven, singular thing to figure out. I wrote this book when I was in my 20s that I did not expect to write, but I was coping with um, like a brutal anxiety disorder. And I was, you know, in a lot of changing states. I was moving out of being in a punk band into like moving to another country. And I was putting my thoughts down. And now I look back at that period as this like incredible capture of a mindset I'll never have again. It was the first time I was experiencing a lot of things and figuring a lot of things out. And, you know, the book at that age is trying, I'm sorry, because I like probably people watching this are in their 20s. And to me, that's like 500 years ago. But like, at the time, I was like, I have to cover everything. I have to cover <laughs> philosophy and, 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 physics and life skills and I have to talk about deep things and funny things. And it was like trying to be, you know, first game syndrome. And mm -hmm. the conclusion is at the end of the book, this character who's gone through the rigmarole of life is like passed out on the grass in a park, staring at this like single blade of grass and realizes like, if I had just sat here the entire time and just looked at this one blade of grass and started to unpack what that is, I probably would be further along than I am right now because I've been spiraling out and I'm exhausted and I have no idea what's going on. But this single blade of grass, it's like, what is it? It's a thing that grows out of the ground because why? Because it was a seed that's in the soil and water came in, and then the sun and then it grew at this pace. And Eventually, someone will mow this thing, and there's a system to that. And you can extrapolate the entire universe from a single blade of grass if you focus on it long enough, right? As opposed to just always kind of being just outside the door trying to figure out how the hell to get in. So it's the same idea. It's, it's you know, just grab the thread in your sweater and start pulling it. And eventually, <laughs> you'll have no sweater. <laughs> Terrible analogy. <laughs> That's so interesting. And it sounds like I can relate to you on this. I just wanting to do so many things in life. And I think that there's something really amazing about that because you see how interesting these different avenues are and you want to experience them all. Um, can I ask you, okay, I've got, I've got two questions on this topic. One is you're obviously doing so many things. Um, you have done so many things already. Do you go through things, do you have like a priority or a specific goal in mind um, or a prioritization system, whether it's what you would work on, like I'm working on this now, or mm. if you work on many things, like um, which one takes priority or how do you, how do you manage these things? Yeah, that's a really excellent question. I think um, there's two parts to it. You know, one is I respect, I've come to respect over time, other people's time. I used to be, you know, in my teens, I was like, I'll show up when I feel like it. It was this super diva, like, you know, if their movie's at seven o'clock, I'll show up at 7.02. And it was rude. Like other people have done something to open up an avenue to you being in their life. And so respect their time, be there early. Um, you're not more important than they are. They have their own path and their own journey. And that's like, so if I'm doing something for somebody else or with somebody else and it has deliverables, the show must go on. It has to happen. It has to happen by the deadline. There's absolutely no question asked. And that puts it at the top of the priority pile. Mm. The second thing I would say is like, eat your broccoli first. Like 
if you have to do income taxes and you have to do homework, like get that shit out of the way. Then you can create in a way that is free and open and it feels like dessert. Um, sitting down to be creative is a weird thing. It shouldn't have to feel like work. It should feel like a flow state. It should feel like you are, you have no rules and no conditions at that time. It's a true playground. You can become any superhero or form of vegetable or fruit or Lego that you want to be. And I constantly have to remind myself of that is you can do whatever you want. There is no four on the floor kick pattern that you have to start with. There is no club that you have to appeal to. There's no any structure. There's no game structure that you have to appeal to. You'll get those fundamentals inherently, but free yourself. In order to do that, go eat your broccoli first. So that's how I prioritize. It's like, what deliverable do I have to deal with that someone else is counting on? And it's also because I hate being treated that same way. I freaking hate being on a project where one person is the bottleneck and they make themselves mm -hmm. hard to reach or they don't take, you know, they don't respond in fair due time and they're holding everybody else up. It can create an enormous amount of tension and anxiety and frustration and resentment. And all it takes is just like check in, like this is where it's at. It might be a bit later. Now you know where we are and you're not sitting in a guessing pattern. So like, the priorities respect others first and, and their state and have the compassion, the empathy to know that they're counting on something from you. Address it honestly. Then do the bullshit stuff that is like taxes and death. Do all that. Mm -hmm. You know, exercise as you would have put it. You would have said like my morning workout, like it sucks, but you get <laughs> used to it. And then it's just a thing that you just do, right? If you're going to, mm -hmm. if it's going to be hard, this is quoting uh, Lana Lux is, if it's going to be hard, it's going to be hard whether you do it or don't do it. So you might as well do the thing that's good for you that's hard as opposed to the thing that's just hard and not good for you. Like, you know, I eat too many donuts and I just watch too much TV. I'm not judging. I'm just saying like whatever it is that, that you think is bad, uh, that's also going to be hard, right? Because then you're going to have, you know, problems from too much donuts and too much sedentary time. And so you might as well just do the push-ups because it's the same shit, but in a better direction. Um, maybe you can't do push-ups. I'm not judging. Like whatever, whatever you're doing, <laughs> you know, maybe it's eating broccoli, whatever. Um, drinking more water, you know, some people mm -hmm. hate water. So drink more water. Um, yeah. That's my answer to your question is it's in priority of like other people's time, stuff you don't really want to do, but have to do no matter what. So you can get it out of your brain and then do what you love, but truly do it freely. That's some excellent advice. Uh, I want to also expand on the get the bullshit stuff done. I struggle with that a lot. I have so many fun tasks in game development that I get so excited for. <laughs> right. It's really hard to not do that and do like something that's like taxes. Yeah. One thing that really helps me is um, you probably have heard of the Pomodoro technique. Yep. And if anyone listening hasn't, it's basically a fixed amount of time that's focused, followed by a short break, maybe like 20 minutes focus, five minutes break, 20 minutes focus until ever either you have a fixed hour to it or if you um, until you get it done. And I yeah. find that those focus sessions, I'm like, okay, 20 minutes, 20 minutes doing taxes. I can do that. And once I get that done, I'll feel better about the rest of my day. And it helps so much. So that's one thing I've, I've discovered that's really helpful with getting those difficult tasks done. Oh yeah. I have, um, a really cool Pomodoro timer I bought on Amazon. Like you mm -hmm. can, you can get software on your desktop that will do it and that's okay. But there's something about a physical object and this one, you just, it's like a, an octagon and you can turn it onto any side. And so it'll be like five, 10, 15, 20, 25 minutes. And whatever side is face up is how long it's going to count down. And then it makes this really annoying alarm clock beep. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it's the way to do a Pomodoro properly is put your freaking phone way too far away to get to, set it to 20 minutes and whatever thing you're doing, that's it. That's the entire encapsulation of your whole the universe. You are in space prison. There's no way out. There's no oxygen outside. This is the only thing you can do. Um, and yeah, if anybody doesn't know, Pomodoro is from tomato, uh, the Italian for tomato. Um, and you can get cute little tomato timers where you turn the top and it'll just like ring at the mm -hmm. 
time out. Class, the OG. Yeah. Uh, Pomodoro. <laughs> yeah. yeah, those are great. So, tell me, tell me a little bit about your current. Um, you've probably talked about this with somebody else, but where are you at with Unity and um, working in a uh, in that engine with all the changes and everything? How are you feeling? Mm. Yeah, I actually just got back from Unite twenty twenty three, and um, well, obviously I was in panic mode. I think with every other Unity developer when the uh, changes were first announced and like. Like, what's what is this going to really happen? Is it going to affect people? Is this a concern? And um, so it was definitely a, a wild month. It felt surreal to, to myself and other developers, I think, who were like, is this really happening? Are we really? It just it felt so weird to be seeing the news and reading things and hearing the reactions. Um, I, I do feel a lot better knowing that that negative reaction actually had an impact and that unity said, Oh wow, we, we, we hear you. And we realize that this is something that you guys are very unhappy with. <laughs> like it was an existential <laughs> threat to their company. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And so they had to, they had to turn around and be like, okay, let's readdress this. And they did. And they even, you know, they're putting in new leadership. And I think that's also a good sign that they're, they actually are committed to taking a better direction. Only time will tell if it's, if that's going to happen. But, but I think that, um, the people speaking speaking out against it, and it, and then them being like, "Okay, we hear you, and we're going to change it." That that does give me some confidence, and I'm you know, yeah, hoping things will go in a really good direction. Especially, you know, the the new CEO um, at the at the event, he was going around to people, introducing himself and talking to talking to the different devs. And I hadn't met the previous CEO, but he, John, uh, yeah, yeah. And they were like, "Oh, this is this is so unusual. Like the last one, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have done this. So we hope that this means he actually cares to talk to the new people and stuff." But it's it's hard to tell. So that I think it's a good sign. We'll see. We'll see. There are some people I truly love and respect at Unity. Really cool people. Um, the guy that made Cinema Machine is someone I consider a personal friend, and mm. you know, um, there's some Cinemachine. other really wonderful people there. Um, and it's it's. To me, the bigger story was how do we avoid ever getting locked into a system where our entire existence depends upon it? You know, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's a whether it's an engine or a person or a configuration for a project, it's like I'm always kind of like, where's the escape? Where's the exit door in this place? Um, if a fire breaks out, are we all going to die? <laughs> That's probably really a, too dark of a of an analogy, but <laughs> but I mean, it's like. That's what I thought. I was like, Unity is difficult because I, you know, I have a bookshelf of Unity books right here, um, and it's fine. I, you know, I like it for a lot of things. Most games and VR experiences are made in Unity. Uh, I'm not judging the fact that anybody makes it, but I did always have a problem with like being locked into a version and the the sort of um, the lack of r- retro compatibility. Uh, I'm not here to dog on Unity at all, but I'm just, that moment was like telling and it's not about Unity, it's about on the bigger picture, like where are we allowing that to happen and where are we putting ourselves into those positions? It's why I really do like open source. Open source is not like the angel of all angels. There can be problems with open source systems, just like there can be problems with nonprofit organizations like OpenAI. Um, but I do like something like Blender or something like Godot where you know, it can never be for sale and um, it can just be extended out in any direction, not because of a board of directors or stockholders, but because the community decides to just add a feature that they merge into the main branch. Um, And a bunch of people poured it over to Godot on their VR projects. And they're like, you know what? It's not that bad. It kind of works. And it's the same with me and my my digital audio workstation, you know, a lot of people are into like Logic and Steinberg, Cubase and Ableton and nice companies. You know, I even know some of their family, bring them over for Thanksgiving. But <laughs> Reaper, which is made by the guy that invented Winamp, um, is $79 perpetual lifetime license one time. They push updates like every three days, $79 for life. And it is the most powerful, customizable program I've ever used. Um, I would, if I ever got a tattoo, I would get Reaper tattooed on my body. Um, you would? Yeah, I would. Because I think it's just, wow. it, it's like the the whole ethic of this thing that allows it to, to be extensible. It's got its own programming language. You can write your own stuff. Like 
their dedication to just improving. Like when you look at the updates, it's nothing sexy. It's just like small, stupid little adjustments and tweaks and refinements that they don't have to do. They're not going to sell copies based on that. Why am I saying all this? Because when it comes back around to you making a game, you want to make a game. You don't want to be caught up in politics and in like this weird looming threat of like, oh, is somebody going to change the rules and the monetization scheme and how I can license this? And, you know, are they going to suddenly add a bug that breaks everything that I'm making? And Steinberg just became this like huge bloatware. Yes, sure, it's used by some post-production houses. And yes, Logic and Pro Tools are, but they're also bloaty, slow. You know, I can open Reaper in like two seconds. I can run Godot on a Raspberry Pi. I could run Godot on my freaking watch if I had to. Mm. Um, it You can literally program Godot on an Android phone and execute a program on it. It's like crazy to me. So wow. a lot of the things that we become used to and that we accept as normal are not. They don't have to be that way. There's a faster, leaner, more democratic way. And working off a repo is awesome. Like just letting multiple people source the solution to the problem in different ways at the same time that can benefit everybody is how we should freaking run the planet. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I'm totally getting no. off my soapbox. So that is that is a that is a huge thing and um so it, I don't, i'm not very familiar with how godot was run i should be after everything that went down but i to be honest um you know i'm, I'm using unity for my project so it, the, the idea of changing didn't come up to me it no was no of, yeah for sure you couldn't do it at this point with your project right. and, and honestly so, godot is not everything that unity is i mean unity has massive massive optimization features built into it that Godot was simply not at that point. If you want to make a operational, beautifully lit with physics 3D game though, you can do it in Godot and you can ship it and it'll be great. Um, if you mm. want to make a 2D game of any kind, Godot is better than Unreal. It's better than Unity. It's better than I would say almost any other engine. Um, and you might not want to make 2D games, you know, uh, but it's getting better all the time. They just did a complete rewrite from version three to version 3.5 to version four, which is a substantially stronger, more elastic, uh, more modern system. And um, just look at the history of it. It's interesting. The people that made it go back a long, long way. Um, they, they started off as a bunch of people who wanted to make an MMORPG and kind of built this thing on the side. And then more and more people got involved. It reminds me of like Janus engine. Um, I don't know who any more knows what the Janus engine is, but may I talk about this for 10 seconds? Please, yeah. I don't so know Janus was like this web. No, it wasn't. It was a massively. No, it wasn't. It was a multi-user virtual reality social platform. It was okay. a launch day product for the Oculus Rift. The logo is like directly behind their heads on the stage when they're launching their headsets and stuff. Okay. Um, it was created in Toronto, the city where you are. You would probably call it Toronto. Um, James McRae was a student at U of T. He went on to become the CTO at Magic Leap. Uh, his teacher, his professor was Dr. Karan Singh, who famously invented facial animation for 3D, and Maya and Houdini. I'm probably overstating, but he pretty much created those tools. And he lives in mm -hmm. Toronto. He teaches at U of T. And he helped James oh. McRae build this thing. And then this thing went out and like a bajillion uh, super like neuromancer type hacker kids just like went and lived in that world. Like it was a whole culture. And we had them at the first VRTO. And there was like Janice houses in LA where they would just go and like Samantha Matthews had this like garage and they would just go and code and they would make primitives and put them in the world and avatars and it was like neon cat everywhere and 2d and 3d and everything all mashed together and they had arcade machines running actual um roms original roms inside of janice they had 360 video like you could just walk in and out of for instant playback they had bitcoin atms in there nested inside of worlds nested inside of worlds it was like completely bananas and way ahead of anything that anybody's really doing, even close to doing right now. 
And they couldn't, they had no UX. I said at the time, I say it now, and I will say it in the future, I was like, there is no big green go button for the outside people. You're all facing inward, and this is going to be a problem. And eventually they ran out of runway. They tried to make this like MySpace version of it called Vesta to make it more accessible, but it just was too late. And um, so then they released it as open source code on the web. And this guy named hmm. James Baikayanu, sorry, I'm a little stuffed up today. Um, sorry. This guy, James by Keanu took it and he adopted the code for JavaScript and 3JS so that it could run on the web. And so I knew how fast this thing was. And when the pandemic started, I uh, needed a place to take my festival online. And so I went to the Janus people and eventually it led me to James. And I was like, hey, I know you're like, you're the guy that's keeping this whole thing and you're really busy and all that, but I really have a use case for you that I think you should think about. I have deep love for this engine, this open source, run by the people for the people engine, which is like totally rogue and punk rock and underground and everything. And it's like, it's like the millennium Falcon. Like it has no fat on it. It's ugly as sin, but damn, it can, you know, run the parsecs when it wants to. So, um, we built this whole engine in web 3d. It can do like real time, 360 stereoscopic 6k playback with spatial audio real time like no buffer in a vr headset right off of your chrome um, parser and uh, we can incorporate any apis like eventbrite ticketing and ready player me avatars and all that and there's like probably like six people still using it <laughs> and the all the code is up on the web and you can just go to the repo and download it and customize it however you want so that to me is interesting that to me now there's no rule book i mean most of the most of the manual is in james's head and i'm constantly trying to pull it down and be like better documentation so let's talk about that for a second documentation like unity documentation used to be like on fleek it was like the best documentation that there was but then i started to read and i'm not dogging on unity i swear to god i'm really not <laughs> I'm just saying as an example, like it was known for its documentation. And then once they started to create these like new features that were not backwards compatible, like the ability to kind of deal with the whatever issues might, I, I wouldn't call them regressions because they're not, they're like new incompatible things. The older documentation started to become obsolete and there wasn't links that say, hey, by the way, this is now this. And when I'm working with Godot, and I'm working with ChatGPT with Godot, and I'm and I built my own um, custom GPT that is like an absolute expert on Godot engine. So anything I feed it, it's like it sees it through a Godot lens. It's read thousands of articles on best practices. It's read all the documentation, everything. But there's no, there's not enough videos that go, hey, three point five. This was the language. And now that exact same thing is called this and four, which is a big deal. Like to call a kinetic body 2D into a character body 2D means all of your code has to be updated. And if somebody doesn't bother to tell you that, it's going to be a hard slog. So uh, documentation, getting all those things down, being able to leverage these tools in order to uh, move forward requires a community that cares to maintain these things. Okay, that's another big blob. Um, but tell me about ChatGPT and you. <laughs> I'm interviewing you now. Have you, have <laughs> I have so many things. I, didn't want to, I don't want to interrupt. Okay, go, like, no, go, so I'll let you address what I said first, and then we'll go into that. Okay, yeah. Um, so, okay. Yes, documentation is so important. And even, as you mentioned, some of the things that, like, if Unity puts out a new feature... I feel like it just goes completely under the radar unless right. there's good documentation. And sometimes like I'm looking through the documentation, I'm like, if this was explained better, so many people would be using this. I right. feel like, right. so I feel like that's, they, it's still a lot better than some other documentation. I've it seen. is. Yes, Quite a it bit is. Better. But when it, when they, when it's not extensive enough, it can, it can really hinder the feature that has probably spent or been so much work that people have put into it. But without explaining it, it goes so un, you know, unloved, really. That's an astute um, point, though, Lana, because uh, I think that I think you just actually unpacked the point that I was hoping to make is that we'll make these games or we'll devise these engines or build these cool things, but we have to take the time to slow down and explain to somebody what just happened. 
you know, mm-hmm. with James, there's so many features that are packed into Janice. He's like all these side projects that he's like incorporated into these powerful things, but nobody knows about it. If James gets amnesia, it's gone with James. And oh uh, in a similar way, I was saying to my friend who's building this really interesting app, I was like, you right now have to be connecting to the public. Again, the UX thing, like you cannot wait six months to then go see if it's going to work or tell people about the features like right now. And, and this is a question of like, how soon do you go into early access? For example, like how, how early is too early? How much Mm -hmm. time is too much time to stop and explain this new feature that your team spent six months developing before it's washed away by the next shiny thing? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't slow down to just process like, what did I just buy this week on Amazon? You know, like what just arrived at my house? I mean, barely opened the box before I'm back on there looking for Black Friday deals. Like we have to slow down in time and just like sit with the things and take a moment with that blade of grass, right? To process like somebody built this feature. There was a need for it. They figured it was sufficiently important that they spent a lot of cycles on this, that we should take a moment to like benefit and and someone needs to document it of course devs will say to you or engineers will say to you there's no point in documenting it because by the time we've taken the time to write it down it'll become obsolete or outdated which is also fair but there has to be some touch point where the the damn thing is just somewhere like yeah no matter how obsolete or outdated it may be okay anyway so that was thoughts on that thank you for picking up on that yeah a hundred percent Okay, before we, I, I really want to get to, I want to understand how you operate better because I find it really interesting. I can really relate to you. And and not only do I also want to do everything, like you're doing so many things, but it's actually very similar things. Like I was once in a punk rock band and I found, I've always found acting so interesting, but just never, never went down that avenue. And mm-hmm. how, how do you like, do you have like an overall life goal or you like, do you have like a big picture or do you, how do you, how do you operate? Right. Uh, no, <laughs> I don't. I think that to be alive is the canvas and the goal is to be the art of it. Um, the goal is to not hurt people as best you can avoid hurting people. Sometimes you don't know you're going to do it and you end up doing it and you can spend a long time thinking through it, which you should spend some time and then reflecting. Sometimes you don't, sometimes you don't know, but if you can avoid, why I'm saying that is you can avoid hurting people and making things better than when you found them in a way that is holistic to others, not just the way you think it should be better. I think Donald Trump should be president. I think GMOs are good for plants. I think oil is bad. That's your opinion, right? If you can zoom out and take a sort of contemplative, non-reactionary view of like, in your small way, how could you make things a little better, easier for other people? Then everything else is fair play. And as long as you pay your fucking taxes, then everything else is fair play. And, And I just have, from the minute I was born into this planet. It's probably a set and setting thing, but I felt this t- this clock ticking down, this candle burning down. I was like, okay, motherfuckers, let's go. Like, This thing is happening. It's on. There is no time to waste. I do not... It's not to say I don't have idle, so-called idle time. And it's not even scheduled idle time. But there is no moment in my entire life where I'm just like, I don't know, what do you want to do? Like... Always there is something. There's always something to learn, engage, consider, invest in, savor, dwell, experience, share. And the road is revealed to me often by way of a glittery, golden, fucking yellow brick road that I see open up. Like, I don't know what the door is. I live with constant uncertainty. I live with a constant lack of resources. I have a billion resources. I, 
I appreciate the power of gratitude and acknowledging those things and not being entitled and not thinking that it's something is owed to me or that I'm being cheated out of something. I have absolutely no fucking entitlements whatsoever when I come here. You get nothing. You're lucky to have a toilet that flushes. But sometimes I'm okay with uncertainty and free falling and not having a single dollar in my account and any assurance of what's going to happen next. Again, people might say lucky for you or easy for you to say, I've got six kids and I live in a bad neighborhood. And that is true. And I, I acknowledge that. But those folks in those positions are also resilient and also capable of achieving all of the things that they're achieving, which are extraordinary. And to be able to understand that that is extraordinary and that that's not nothing, right? Just surviving, just staying alive, just not causing harm to others, just to make the road easier for others is a billion things. That's 99% of the joy. And the other 1% is like having the mental framework to feel and experience the exhilaration of all of that, to go, this is the game. This is the jam. There is nothing to complete. There is nothing to achieve. There is nothing that is correct or incorrect. It is all an experiment uh, that is worthy of doing. And there's no person that is repeatable. It's just simply impossible. Even if I uploaded your entire cognition into a neural um, machine learning construct that could start to iterate, the displacement from the position of you to it was already a deviation, which is an interesting experiment. So there's no thing to accomplish. There's nothing to do. <laughs> there's just the ability to stay alive and well. And by virtue of doing that, you've already changed the entire universe. So I go by that. What I mean by a glittery road is sometimes I don't know where the door is, but I don't take a panic action. I don't like say, okay, fuck, I better get like a really safe job and, and just not take any chances because I got to And sometimes you have to do that, but I don't do that. I put myself in a position of I'm going to have to fight my way out of this or perish. The thing I'm trying to do is the thing that I'm trying to do, and it has to live or die by its own merits. That prevents it from being a hobby. Hobbies are fine. If you read um, Franny and Zoe... He's sitting in the bathtub and he's like, hobbies, who has time for hobbies? Um, <laughs> but I don't let them be hobbies. I like everything I do is, is as important to me um, because then I can experience it in its totality. Uh, that might sound melodramatic. So terrible answer. But on the other hand, what I would say to somebody who is, is lost and confused and is in their late 20s is like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I don't know who I am. I need to find myself. I need to travel to Europe or whatever it is that people think that they have to do. <laughs> just, just ask yourself, like, what do you think would be great? What is in your heart of hearts, like your yearning, burning objective? And then go to that vision in your mind and anchor it and then reverse engineer it from its absolute positive outcome to your present. Instead of saying like, what should I do next? Who should I talk to? Go the other way around. Say, this is the ultimate version of this that I can imagine. What would have had to have happened right before the last thing? And then what would have to have happened right before that? Mm -hmm. If I wanted to be an Oscar winner on the stage, accepting my thing and asking people to be kinder to goats, I needed to be in a film that could have qualified to have won an Oscar that was probably being managed by folks who have alliances with the board that makes those nominations happen. You know, it's not that it's like ethically correct, it's just that's how it would have worked and you would have been in the you would have been in the line of sight of a manager or an agent who has got relationships with those people, which meant you probably were at a workshop for a training thing where they go and they scout or you were doing the kinds of projects that they care about. You know, if you want to win an Oscar, you probably don't go do a sitcom. You probably go do films that are like likely to win Oscars. And when you reverse engineer it, right? Do you want to be John Romero? Do you want to be Brenda Romero as a game developer? Like, who do you want to be? Reverse engineer that to your present. That will help. That will help when you're like, 
wanting to not completely spin your wheels. Mm. So hopefully that gives you some insight into the mind of Karim um, and how this all goes down. I would also say like, I never, everything is showtime. Like that's not to say it has to be busy or hectic. It means there's no, like rehearsal is the product. The dress rehearsal is happening all the time. This might be the one time I ever get to talk to you. This might be the one time I ever get interviewed. This might be the one, this is not off the radar. This is not off the cuff. Anything I do is meant to be the best version that I can bring at that moment in whatever way that I can. And I also mm -hmm. can accept later that I always did that and therefore I don't regret it. You know, if it didn't work out, if it sucked, I'm like, yeah, but dude, that was the best you could do at that moment. And you never allowed yourself to bring less, even if you were tired. So those things drive my uh, existence. And I hope that they also help when I'm able to share that to inspire other people who do feel, because I have, I have younger siblings. I'm the oldest. I always, I'm basically talking to them. I'm just like, <laughs> here's what it's like to be five years older than you or 10 years older than you. And this is the shit I can tell you that I figured out or that I, oh. I botched it. And hopefully you'll, you'll hear me, but you probably won't hear me till you need, you're in the same position. Right. Wow. Yeah. Those are all really great um, insights, including, I think the way you, like you bring your best version of yourself to everything that you show up for. I think that's such an important um thing to keep in mind because especially if you want to do many things or if you want to have if you have these big goals and these big ambitions you really want to take every opportunity you have and make the most out of it because otherwise you know how, how do you even differentiate what is important and what isn't because you never know what's important you never yeah. know what can come out of if you do a really good job with something that can that can really resonate that can be more important than something you thought that was really important oh no, I dropped the ball on that thing that was so important, but maybe that didn't matter. And the thing you thought didn't matter didn't. So hundred percent, Lana, for sure. Do your best. As yeah. an actor, I can tell you from 30, how long have I been? From 40 years, 43 years of experience as an actor. Totally. Uh, what I learned is, and that's not how old I am. <laughs> I'm older than that. Um, <laughs> what I learned is, like at the beginning, I would go into an audition and I was so like, I have to, you know, these casting directors are scary. This is hard. I have to do this right. What do I even have to do that is right? Actually, that question was a more mature question. The more mature question I eventually learned was, how do I even figure out what it is that is what they're looking for? And then the next thing I learned was, I need to stop looking at these casting directors as like these sort of like adjudication, you know, uh, um, inquisition panel that's out to kill me and more as like collaborators like hey how can I help you to get done for today like what is the thing that we're trying to solve together instead of making them this like Mount Olympus and me this meager peasant like it was seeing people at eye level and considering like we're all working on the same objective like what is that objective and also letting it go right Auditions suck. I don't do them anymore because it's really terrible, especially these days. You don't even get to meet the people. You just put yourself on tape. You have to drop everything you're doing, learn eight pages of sides, on camera, off book, look great because you probably haven't looked at yourself in the mirror for three weeks, deliver <laughs> this thing, don't get paid for it, and then never hear back anytime. Now, influencers, content creators, all that good stuff, would be like, are you kidding me? Like, dude, I won't even do like a YouTube video if somebody doesn't pay me. I'm like, let me show you how it used to be. Let me show you what it's <laughs> like to be an actor. Like, why do you do it? It's insane. It's totally insane. So, um, and I don't actually have like a but for that. It's just insane and it's awful. Um, like full stop. <laughs> but, but I did learn to not get hard on myself about it. I'm like, look, man, the, It'll come again and you'll do another thing and you have no idea. And then what happens is after you've done like 200 auditions that went nowhere, suddenly your agent calls up and goes, hey, they specifically requested you for this role. You're like, who? This person from like three years ago that saw your tape 
thought about you. And when I did True Blood, when I got beheaded and I played the freaking, you know, I played the sheriff of Area 5, I'd never even watched, I never even watched the show before. <laughs> and it wasn't the audition. It was that they were like, oh, Karen would be perfect for this. I was like, oh, okay. Oh, what? I guess I'm doing True Blood now. It, that's what happens. When I worked with Peter Greenaway, I was... I, you know, one of my hero directors of all time, most people don't know who he is, but one of the greatest directors in my mind of all time, I was flown to tour in Italy. I was, I was fed. I was like staying in a castle. I was working with some of the greatest actors of the, of the age. The audition was like a meeting three years prior at the Montrose hotel in Hollywood, where we didn't even read sides. We basically talked about Hieronymus Bosch paintings and my grandfather for about 10 minutes. Wow. So you never know. And bring your best and just be authentic, you know, and don't be an entitled brat. Don't be a diva, like be a diva in a good way, but don't be a diva in a bad way. Um, yeah. What was the question? <laughs> it, I don't know, but I, I, I do want to, um, I kind of want to go back to something you said earlier that I feel like you're, you're ta kind of talking about again. Um, you mentioned before how, you, you're, you're going about doing, experiencing the world and, and trying to not harm people around you. Or like, I, I think, I think you do a lot more than that. I think you actually try to enrich the people around you. And um, I think it can be also overwhelming if you try to chase even that, like trying to do mm -hmm. good, because like you said, what you think is good doesn't, doesn't mean what that that's what everyone thinks is good. And even if the majority of people think something's good, it doesn't mean that it is. They, yeah. they could have the wrong information. They could have the wrong pattern recognition. And so there is, it's very hard to come up with an, an all, all, un, all encompassing good or bad. Yep. And so I think um, what you're saying with also, it kind of relates to it with the don't be a diva is, is just to, to go about these things and, to a to make sure that like like when you're what's the term like the your plane's going down you got to put oxygen on yourself first. I think in a similar way you got to make sure that you are doing the things that you need to do for yourself because then at least once you're self sufficient and you right. can be okay, don't become someone else's on. burden. Right, and then you can go and try to help the people around you, make their be compassionate at least. Try to try to yeah. be good to the people around you, and I think that that's. Honestly, in a lot of times, that's better than going and seeking like um, to do like to do good because a lot of the time that can become so complicated. I Just agree. Self sufficiency, fostering self sufficiency. Like I, mm -hmm. I think another key to my uh, work throughout my life has been how can I manage this uh, without requiring again someone else to constantly pay attention to my stuff, to fix my stuff, to solve my problem, to give me resources. You know, often we go out like, oh, no one ever buys my thing. No one ever does my thing. Da, da, da. It's like, if you can find self-sufficiency, you know, Vampire Survivors, right? This game, Vampire Survivors, was a little indie game that a guy working at a, at a hamburger restaurant was, he wanted to be able to like play a game, but not have to fully pay attention. So it's kind of like an idle clicker passive game. But it's a, it's like an RPG where you're leveling up and everything. And he invented basically a genre by doing so. And this little game that was selling for $4, $2.99 is such a phenomenon now that they're making a series about it. It's been orchestrated by a 60-piece orchestra. They've like sold millions of units. It's like one of the top games on the Steam Deck. That game is about being a little vampire hunter who is self-sufficient like he if you if you reach the the perfect apex state of that game you don't even move you literally just stand there and just go <laughs> and just destroy waves and wa impossible seeming waves of shit coming your way and i learned that at the beginning i was like i was moving around too much i was trying to level up i was trying to min max everything and then i was like oh if you get the combination right, you get into a state of like homeostasis where nothing can touch you anymore. And it's yeah. fine. It's just self-sufficient. Um, so I'm proud of having lived in LA for 25 plus years and not having to run. 
I wouldn't say, I'm going to say this in a fair way, not having to go back home and to rely. I mean, I do rely sometimes on my parents' kindness, support, encouragement, you know, everything else. They've definitely saved me a few times, but being able to just like hold my ground in this incredibly difficult environment and industry is my point of pride. It's not that I didn't win an Oscar. It's not, it's just like you survived, you lived, you're okay. Like everything's kind of in balance. That's not, that's an illusion of, of standing in place. It's nothing is standing in place. Everything is constantly volatile. Entropy is coming at us from all angles, but to be able to just hold your ground for a little while and just keep going is incredible. It's an incredible feat. Be kind and humble with others because A, you don't know what they're going through, but B, because they, they, might be supporting you in ways that you don't realize, or they might be there to teach you a lesson. And then, um, and then Goethe, I was listening to Barbara Streisand's book on Audible because my friend was reading it. I was like, I'm going to listen to this. Me and Barb, we have a lot in common. She's a Taurus. She loves food. You know, she went through it all. Um, and she, she quoted Goethe and she said, you know, when you commit to a thing, the universe will come to you in support. When you are finding resistance and the thing that you're trying to do, it may be because, you know, and, and as a punk rocker, you get this. It's like, it's like, fuck the establishment, fuck the norms, <laughs> fuck the da, da, da. like it's everything that. And and yeah, but it's gonna be might maybe a, a harder road when you are counter to everything. Um than if you're Green Day. Green Day can be punk rock. But at the same time, they know how to align with what people want and need to catalyze their emotions at the time. And so money flows through them like blood flows through a vein, right? If, if you're finding that there's resistance to everything you do, it's because you're not aligning with other folks' needs. This is UX. If you go into alignment with other people and what they would feel better by, the formula is do something that's like, 85% familiar and proven and 15% super weird. It's more or less that formula that will get you success because people need to anchor what they're looking at with something that they're, they can say, Oh, it's like, you know, steak and eggs. Oh, it's like Pac-Man. Oh, it's like Kim Kardashian meets Wampuses in the swamp, you know? And you go, oh, that's an interesting twist. How cool would that be? If you're going to mm -hmm. pitch something on Steam, it's actually like play testers will say, oh, it's vampire survivors. It's a Metroidvania. Oh, it's, you know, it's uh, Call of Duty meets Starfield. And then you go, okay, I got that anchored in my brain. What an interesting combination. You didn't start from scratch. If it's too weird, it literally just doesn't it just doesn't process in people's brains. It just simply doesn't exist. They have no anchor. So when you align with the universe, it will come and give you resources. That's really interesting. And I'm, I'm really curious what percentages of familiar and unusual are successful for different games or products in general. Um, that's a really interesting thought because I think that's one thing that um, AAA games tend to do is they go with stuff that's, more familiar because it's tested and proven to be good and, and people like it. And they, they tend to have a, a smaller weird side to them. Usually not always. Sometimes there's some interesting ones and you're right. Like I think it's kind of like the risk you're taking the weirder or the more unfamiliar, the larger that percentage is, that's the bigger risk that you're taking. And maybe, maybe there will be a group of people who are like that. I get that even though it's un unfamiliar for whatever we're looking at. Um, but it's definitely a risk to take. So that's an interesting, uh, yeah. I mean, sometimes it's so radically different that it just gets talked about because it's so radically different that it just blows up on its own. But that is called a unicorn. <laughs> that is, <laughs> you know, like you can, you can go to school and try to say, understand how to pitch a film. Like I used to do this when I was studying, um, film producing and, and, uh, funding films, uh, back in the 1900s, like they would say, well, the Blair Witch Project made a hundred million dollars off of a million dollar budget. I'm like, yes, but the Blair Witch Project is not a comparable 
that's a freaking unicorn one off, like never going to happen twice lightning in a fucking blue moon. So you can't use those kinds of things as comparables. Well, vampire survivors was whatever, but look at beat saber beat saber was, there was a game that was about um, punching balls that came at before it that was super super popular that nobody remembers now and then there was another one that was i think called light light sword trainer or something and it was just about swinging swords and then beat saber like literally put the two things together it was called sound boxing i think sound boxing and light blade trainer and then they just literally put the two things together and it's freaking beat saber it didn't come mm. out of nowhere it came out of seeing two really cool things like chocolate and peanut butter and they taste great together um, so that's a better formula generally uh, than I'm going to make Blair Witch, which is what are your odds? Well, Blair Witch was a unicorn for a reason. <clears throat> Blair Witch is such an interesting case because it was the first one. And after it's been done, it's you can't do it again. Found footage. Yeah. Yeah. Found footage. And like this whole I didn't know until recently that they did. Um, they did it like a almost like an. ARG uh, campaign where oh, there's a yeah. website of missing people that I didn't know about. Then no wonder it blew up. Like that's if you found that this these ads for like missing people who were the people in the movie, and then you saw that this found footage of them came out, like you would be even more interested. And then even when you found out that that was all part of the marketing, you just appreciate the genius of it. Like either way, like you're gonna get more invested in this movie. It was yep a brilliant movie. Like, but you can't replicate that because it was right. so time once it's done you can't do it again but you can replicate it and we'll talk about it in one second so yeah my friend in hollywood actually got a vhs tape with a handwritten label that said this is one of the 10 copies of these people that went missing in the woods and it was actually a promo for blair witch but it wasn't pitched like that he literally was like i think i have a snuff film on my on this vhs at home and that was the kind of level of insidious no pun intended, street level marketing that they were doing to create that hype. Um, and yes, it is a stroke of genius to be like, what if we shot? But you have to also remember that Blair Witch came out of a time in the 90s where everybody had these big giant camcorders and they were like filming everything like ENG style. It wasn't like everybody had a smartphone um, shooting, you know, 6K on their iPhones or whatever. So that is a product of its time. Um, mm. But if you go on Steam, and you look up souls like or survivors like you will you will see a list of like 800 vampire survivors clones they're reskinned i'm like holy crap like this is a direct rip off but then i ask myself like is it a rip off or is it just that now this is a genre just like found footage is a genre so movies like cloverfield or i'm not going to think of any found footage films right now but anything yeah. that came after that is fair play because it's a new subgenre that was created and there's and now people can anchor themselves oh you want to go see a found footage movie tonight it'll be fun it's halloween and you're like yeah i don't need to like do the whole lift of like getting a snuff vhs tape to my house <laughs> to get the kind of experience that i'm i only have 15 minutes to to buy into it's like i don't have time for all that like i just want a found footage night let's do it and you can rely on that you can build on that 